non-duality and Jesus and Buddha. Let's really go out on a limb here and apply some non-dualistic thinking to some of our history. Like one, Buddha. Who was he? What did he discover? What did it mean? If we put Buddha into the long timeline of human beings, the timeline that, that we're starting to see as really, really likely to have occurred, then we see that there was like a hundred thousand years of human beings living on the planet in what we would call the non-dual state, living in a native worldview, living together with the land, in the land. And the thing about non-duality is that we're not fixated on the truth. So because of that, we're able to explore all sorts of different ideas. So we can kind of use this timeline and Buddha to start going, well, wait a minute, maybe the stories we've been told don't really nail what happened. In a nutshell, the story that we're told about Buddha is that he was a prince and then he left his palace and went off in search of enlightenment. And he had to really, really do a lot of very radical things to himself and finally achieved enlightenment. Then he started gathering people around him and he started talking about the experience. He only had his own experience really as an example you know, without really this long, long, long context to put it in. But let, let's tell the story in a little bit of a different way. So we all know the story of white man, right, came to the Americas and conquered the natives and subjugated them. And one of the reasons that um, native wisdom teachers are telling us is because the Western mind is broken. We're living in this dual state where we believe that the earth and even other people are objects for us to own and use. And this is one of the reasons why we've created this, you know, huge ecological disaster on the earth is because we believe that everything is just a commodity. We even believe each other are commodities, and that's why our relationships are just so impossible. So this state of being is what we're starting, you know, here and now to call the conqueror's mind, the conquerors, that you have to conquer the world and use the world. Buddha was the same. So he, you know, he was about 800 years before the year zero, the year of Christ, you know, when our, we started our calendar. But it was thousands of years since the conquering mind had come and taken over that whole landscape. And Buddha was a rich prince and he had tons of slaves and his whole family had the whole um, society that they knew basically enslaved and working for them so that they could live lux luxuriously in their castle. Buddha comes out of his castle one time and just sees the misery in everybody around him. But he couldn't go, oh, we're conquerors. We conquered the native indigenous people of this land 2,000 years ago, and, and now we've enslaved them. Look at them. No, instead, he just kind of saw human beings, and he saw all the suffering, and he was like, how does a human being get out of this suffering? So he, through all sorts of meditations and, and really difficult uh, situations, managed to drop his divided mind 
and just reach this place of just calm connectedness with the whole world. He, he discovered who he was and who we are, who each of us are, when you discover it, is just a kind of a, a nothingness, a hum, the, the life force of yourself. And so he started teaching this, but he was only teaching it from the internal experience. So he was trying to teach people, how do we find this internally? And because they did not know that this was the natural state of human beings for hundreds of thousands of years, he just kind of assumed this was something that, you know, a regular person is broken and then they're able to step into this highly attained state. So this was kind of a basic misunderstanding of what the enlightened state was. Instead of really realizing just firmly, ah, this is coming back home to what the human is supposed to be, it was more like, oh, this is attaining the state that the human is supposed to be. And that kind of you know, unfortunately, really messed up huge societies because people started seeing enlightenment as something that it would take lifetimes and lifetimes to achieve and something that was really difficult to achieve and something that was really rare to achieve. And because the divided mind is so attached to hierarchy, naturally, we took the enlightened beings and we put them, you know, way up in, you know, in our imagination instead of just down to the earth, boom, what humans are supposed to be. So Buddha was very much like you and me. He just woke up one day and realized, oh my gosh, we are so divided. How do we get together? And yes, of course, you can go on that path to find out who you are through meditations and, you know, examining the inner self, you know, lots of the non-dual techniques constantly going, who am I, who am I, who am I, until you break through. Or you can like see the whole big picture and realize that we are searching for this genetically baked in state of the natural human. So see how we take a, take a story in our history and we change the context of it. And it has a totally different meaning for our lives. Well, what about Jesus? So one of the things, I, I see lots of people like, was Jesus a non-dual teacher? You know, and you take the sayings that he has and try to work it into some sort of uh, non-dual philosophy. Or we can use our intelligence in a non-dual way and really, really examine the story. And so with non-duality, you don't ever fixate on that truth. So everything can kind of remain curious and we can examine details and things that we know in a whole new way. So what if, what if Jesus never existed? There is tons of information that Buddha existed and that was 800 years before. How come we don't have any evidence that Jesus existed? This right here should be enough to just kind of make us, whoa, that's kind of weird. We know that Muhammad existed, right? There's tons of evidence for it, and he was only just a couple of years after Jesus. But we have no real evidence that Jesus existed, except for um, Josephus, Flavius wrote a couple of lines in a book that's a little bit questionable. So, what would that mean? Like, I don't know if that's true or not. I'm not saying it's true. I'm just saying that when you're coming from the non-dual perspective, you are willing to examine things and go, uh, well, so, 
what would this mean? What would that mean? You know, and, and kind of see how would it make things different for us? There's a book, uh, Caesar's Messiah, where he claims he has evidence that um, Jesus never existed and, he, and the story was actually invented by the Romans and used to keep their slaves under control. It's kind of an interesting story. And then you kind of look at, well, what's the really result of Christianity? What's it, what has it turned into? It's like a really good thing to keep masses of people under control, isn't it? That doesn't prove anything, does it? But when we're looking at life with this non-dual perspective, and also when we're looking at life with the non-dual reality that we are all home already, that we are built, our DNA is hardwired to be awake human beings. When we look at the world with, with those two perspectives, then this is something that we can start enjoying as a thought, as a way to sort of make sense of our lives and also as a way to start stepping beyond these stories. Um, iconoclast, you bust icons. What would it mean? What would that mean if that was true? What would it mean if it wasn't true? We don't know, but we're able to look at things in a totally different way. And this is kind of like taking a different, a whole different context of life and using it to examine the things that we just accept to be true instead of fixating on truth or not truth. Or instead of just going from one ideology to the next, like it'd be very easy to go from the ideology of believing in Christ to the ideology of believing that he never existed. Both of those are still fixed belief systems that aren't going to really take us anywhere in society. So the non-dual perspective is finding the ground of being and then using that ground of being to discover how do we collectively live together in a new way that's in harmony with the whole earth. Does believing 100% in Buddha's story put us in complete harmony with the earth? You know, it kind of doesn't because there's a lot of truth in, you know, enlightenment does exist. You can get there in a second, but believing in this rarefied illuminated being does not serve us very well. Same thing with Jesus. There's so many things about this story that are very divisive and not just between people, but between ourselves. The more we force ourselves to believe something that's kind of unbelievable, the more we're dividing ourselves. And that doesn't mean completely throw it away but examine it. So what is this? Now, there are tons of fabulous Christian writers and saints throughout the years who, who have examined Christianity in this, this way and have found, you know, pulled out the really good stuff about it instead of just throwing the, the whole thing away. And then this also gives us a way to kind of examine, well, what are we doing now? Because in so many ways, the new age religion that has sprouted up everywhere, you know, creates your real, own reality and crystals and just, you know, everybody being a spiritual teacher of some kind or, uh, or another. These things are really just kind of Christian ideals put in a new context. And when you can cut free yourself from being attached to the concepts, you can kind of see, oh, well, this is a concept and that's a concept. Another good example, communism or capitalism, right? They're both, con they're both um, ideologies. 
if you want, you have you can fix to one or the other and force it on everybody, or we can examine. Well, this seems to kind of make societies go in this way, and this seems to make societies go in this way. And are there other options available? So this is all about using non-duality to keep our thinking fluid because the left side of our brain wants to fix on things but it's com- totally capable of being a fluid thinking tool if we allow it to be because there is a you who is managing the whole thing and we have this vast perception side of our brain that's able to do just as much work and expand things out and look at them. And so it's this this expansive, curious way of looking at things that is going to determine what steps humanity takes next. <laughs>